Today we are going to be discussing Chapter 4, Civil Liberties and the corresponding Supreme Court cases that go along with each of those amendments in the Bill of Rights. Now, a basic definition of civil liberties, civil liberties are the protections afforded to you in the Bill of Rights against arbitrary influence uh, from the government. Now, the easiest way that i found to remember the, the first ten amendments of the Constitution is uh, with this silly little acronym, Fat Sit Jeps. So if you can remember this kind of mnemonic device or whatever you want to call it, this is going to really help you understand and memorize the Bill of Rights. So let's go through each one. Okay, the F in our uh, little uh, device here stands for uh, freedom. So that's how you remember the uh, First Amendment here. Now, we like to call the First Amendment our five-for-one deal. And what that means is that within this, there are five different protections underneath the First Amendment. Freedom of speech. We have press. We have religion. And we'll get into this in a moment. Then we have assembly. And then we have petition. Okay, now the Second Amendment, the A, stands for, uh, what we have here is right to bear arms. And then three, we have troops. No quartering of troops in people's civilian homes. All right, now that's the first three. The second three, these are going to be uh, rights of uh, privacy, or sorry, search and seizure, and then rights of criminal defendants. So for Amendment number four, we have the S stands for search and then seizure. And then number five... The I stands for incrimination, which means that you do not have to testify against yourself. This, the uh, T in the, the Sixth Amendment is a trial by jury. Now, the Seventh Amendment, we're not really going to worry about, but it stands for jury in a civil trial. I wouldn't worry about this one too much. Uh, it basically means that if you are going to Sue someone for damages over $20, and you get a jury in a civil trial. That's what the Constitution says. So we really don't worry about this one very much. Now, the Eighth Amendment stands for uh, excessive, if you can read this, excessive bail and cruel and unusual punishment. Nine is people, all right, unenumerated rights, so rights to the people, meaning that rights that aren't mentioned now, just because it's not in the Constitution doesn't mean it's not there. And then rights to... Uh, the states. And so these two amendments here were essentially to get the Anti-Federalists on board in 1791. Alright, now we're going to go in order here. Let's talk about what free speech is. First Amendment. We're going to look at a lot of First Amendment cases. You're going to see a lot of First Amendment cases here up front. Okay, so here's the First Amendment. Notice the first word, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, a literal reading of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights says Congress. Congress shall make no law. Well, what about the states? Can the states do this? And we are going to get into this here in a moment. So keep in mind... Originally, it was Congress that shall make no law abridging these five freedoms. Okay, now there are certain different types of expression. Now when we say freedom of expression, what we're talking about here is there's always a balancing act. There's always scales. That your right to express yourself however you want has to be weighed against some compelling state interest. And what this means in simple English is that there are some things, some things that one could be, that could be said that might be weighed against the compelling interest, and then the compelling interest weighs out. Uh, one way I like to think of this uh, when we look at the different types of, uh, of, of speech, what I like to do is think of it like a pyramid. So this is our pyramid, okay? The very bottom, the purest protection, these are, these are speaking, writing, filming, and drawing. These types of speech are the, are, are, have the most stringent protections under the Bill of Rights. Um, 
And then in the middle, and we're going to come to the Supreme Court case that defines this, we have symbolic speech. Now, this is speech that has some kind of restrictions, meaning time, right? When you can say something, when you can march up place, and then a manner. So this fits in the middle. So sometimes this is regulated, sometimes it's not. Unprotected speech would be up here. What this means, things like obscenity, defamation, and then fighting words, these are things that are less likely to be protected under the Bill of Rights. Now, fighting words doesn't mean that you're challenging someone to, to fisticuffs. Fighting words essentially means things like uh, slandering someone or uh, words that could be used to incite violence. Okay, now, Supreme Court cases tend to freak people out because there's so many of them. And, but I'm going to give you some tips on how to remember. Each Supreme Court case has a certain tagline that you're likely to see on AP tests and anything with the College Board. Now the second tip to remember here is you don't have to know the details surround, like all the things that led up to the case. I might tell the story of what happened, but the main thing that you need to be concerned with is the significance, okay? Why is this case significant? Alright, the first case we're going to talk about is Shank versus U.S. This is 1919. So what happened was during World War I, there was a guy named... Uh, Charles T. Shank, and he mail, mailed all these things to World War I draftees. And what they did is they suggested that these guys not submit to the draft. It was a monstrous wrong, etc., 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 communist propaganda, or socialist propaganda. They said, do not submit to the intimidation of the U.S. government. Well, the question, Shank sued, and what the, the constitutional question was, are Shank's words protected by the free speech of the First Amendment? Okay, and here's the significance. What the court said was that and here's the way to remember this, the clear and present danger test. If someone says something, and that's why I have this on here, fire in a movie theater. This is a fire in a movie theater case. which, uh, And that was the words that were used uh, in the opinion that said not even someone who yelled fire in a movie theater would be protected. Now, or someone who was in a theater where fire was yelled. This is the first time the Supreme Court had limited free speech, and the reasoning was that all of these people in this movie theater here would not be protected if somebody, you know, way up here thought it would be funny to yell fire. That would endanger the public well-being. So the, concept, the, the Supreme Court uh, ruled against uh, Shank in that Supreme Court. Um, you know, and you think about modern-day examples like today. Obviously, there are certain things that you could not say in this scenario here, right? You wouldn't say bomb. You wouldn't start talking about, you know... Uh, uh, sensitive things, you know, talking about how you hate the U.S. government and you like explosives and whatnot, right? There's certain things that you could say, you can't say here. Now, you could go and say that in the middle of a field somewhere, but, you know, once again, this is restricted to time and place. Or, for example, you would never ever say, hook them here, right? That would be obviously endangering your safety. Okay, now this is a very, very, very important case, all right? Make sure you understand Gitlo versus New York. Now, if you remember, the, 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 one of those first slides, I showed you the text of the First Amendment. Remember that what happened was the state governments looked at that and they said, well, the Congress says they shall make no law. It says nothing about the state governments. Well, in Gitlow versus New York, um, in 1925, here's what happened. The Supreme Court is going to use something very important here. What we're talking about here is what is called selective incorporation of the incorporation doctrine. Write that down. It's tremendously important. Here is why. Because up to this point, states have been able to get around the First Amendment because it said Congress. Well, what the Supreme Court did is they used the 14th Amendment. They used this thing called the Due Process Clause, which said that no state shall deprive its citizens equal protection and due process. And what they did was they said, okay... Whenever we get a Supreme Court case with these, that has to do with the Bill of Rights here, that what we're going to do is when we rule on it, it's not going to apply just to the national government. From now on, it's also going to apply to the state and local governments. Now, if you notice at the very bottom here, if you can see, these are some of the amendments that have been incorporated. That's why it's called selective, because it's, it's piecemeal. It doesn't happen all at once. The Supreme Court can't just wake up and say, all right, we want to overturn this, or we want to set a new precedent. If you notice, it, said it goes one, and then it skips to four. Well, actually, since this graphic was made, the Second Amendment has been incorporated that overturned some uh, gun bans in Chicago and, and 
uh, D, uh, DC. Notice that there's no Third Amendment. There's no the Third Amendment hasn't been incorporated because we really haven't had a problem uh, of courting of troops in this country. So keep in mind, so these these amendments. It's the Fourteenth, okay, plus whatever amendment the Supreme Court is deciding on. That that makes it uh, apply to the state and local governments. Okay, the next Supreme Court case on our journey uh, was decided in 1969. This is still the First Amendment. This was the infamous case of Tinker versus Des Moines. So this, uh, if you notice, this, this young woman right here, is, her name is Mary Beth Tinker. Her and her brother decided, uh, as high school students, that to protest the Vietnam War, notice the time period here, uh, they would go to school in these hideous, outlandish, and um, vulgar black armbands. And so what they did was they wore these black armbands to school one day to protest the Vietnam War. Well, we all know how school districts are, and the school districts banned them, and Mary Beth Tinker and her brother sued the school district. Now, the tagline here is this is, these are the, this is the black arm supreme, uh, black arm bands case. So, what happens is, well, this was, uh, the, 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 the school district's decision was ruled unconstitutional. That, and what the court said was that students' uh, constitutional rights do not stop at the school school gate door, schoolhouse door. Now, you have to remember, this is, this is the high watermark of, uh, of rights for students and free speech under the Constitution. Ever since then, like, students are like one in four when it comes to suing school districts. So enjoy this little victory while you can. Okay, the next case is in 1986. This is Bethel versus Frazier. Now, what's interesting about this Supreme Court case is you're starting to see the Supreme Court erode a little bit of the free speech uh, rights of students in school. Now, the guy that you're looking at is a student by the name of uh, <clears throat> Matthew Frazier. And what he did is he got up and gave a speech for a uh, fellow student who was running for a class office named Jeff Coleman. And what he did is he gave a speech that was very, very, very uh, laced with sexual innuendos. So I'm going to show it to you, pause, pause it, and then you read it. So go ahead and pause the recording if you haven't done so already. Okay, so Matthew Frazier is a pretty clever guy. This, this speech got all kinds of, you know, riotous... Applause from the student body, of course. Well, the Supreme Court actually um, ruled that the school district was correct, and that what happened was that student speech that curtails the learning environment of students can be prohibited. Um, and so Matthew Fraser lost his case. And what's interesting now is I think he teaches English at like Princeton for whatever, or for something like that. Okay, now this is a big one. You're no, you're going to notice here that some <laughs> A lot of interesting controversial cases start out in the state of Texas. Who knows why? Well, there's a guy by the name of Greg Johnson. And this, ca this case first started in, uh, 19, um, in the mid-1980s. So the guy here, his name is Greg Johnson. And this is going to be symbolic speech. That's, that's your tagline here. Well, Greg Johnson was going to protest the, uh, the use of uh, or deployment of American nuclear weapons around the world. Now, Greg Johnson is kind of this Birkenstock flag or flag burning hippie guy, and so what he does is he goes to the Dallas City Hall and he lights up the he lights up all glory right in front of the city hall, and he's tackled by police. Now, here's where where the Dallas District Attorney made a stupid decision. He could have prosecuted Greg Johnson for one of for two things. The first one he could have done was disorderly conduct, right? Or uh, th that would have definitely stuck. However, the district attorney feels like he needs to send a message, and so what he does is he, he uh, um, charges Greg Johnson with desecrating a venerable object. All right, well, Greg Johnson sues, and, and so the case goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and then what happens is in 1989, they hand down this landmark decision which said that Greg Johnson was in the right. It's called symbolic speech. There's a time, place, and manner. And this was a very, very, very unpopular uh, ruling at the time period. In fact, in the early 1990s, numerous um, anti-flag burning amendments were proposed in Congress, but obviously they never made it out of the chambers. Because if you think about it, if you, 
legislate against flag burning, as horrendous as it is to most of us, uh, for to uh, you know dis dishonors the memory of those who have fought and died in the service of our country. What hap I mean, burning a flag is one thing, but what happens if you wear an American flag as a T-shirt? That might be something you know that I consider I consider uh, desecrating the flag. Or what if you go to Old Navy and you buy those flip flops that have you know. American flag on them. And every time you take a step, you're stepping on the flag. So it kind of opens up a whole can of worms. So the Supreme Court ruled that symbolic speech, flag burning, is, is um, permittable. Obviously, though, it requires some kind of regulation. I can't just light up an American flag in school to protest. I would have to do uh, go outside, go somewhere, file a permit. But in theory, I could do it. Um, and and this, was, this case has to do with, um, like I said, symbolic speech. Okay, so all of these cases we're talking about in the First Amendment so far, is, that's, well, not all of them, but Near versus Minnesota, and then the one before, Texas versus Johnson, also used Selective Incorporation. All right, Near versus Minnesota, 1931. The key word to remember here is a term called prior restraint. Now, if you're in journalism, you may have heard this. Prior restraint is a fancy word for censorship. Now, what this means is that if I work for the White House office, I cannot go to the New York Times and demand that they not print something and and threaten threaten them. I can't do that. Now I can politely ask them, "Hey, can you sit on this news story or can you wait before you run it?" But the the US government, uh, state governments can't censor the press. Now this is a landmark ruling in favor of free fr of the freedom of the press. So remember, this is your key this is your tagline right here. Prior restraint. All right. Now the next case, 1971. This is this is going to reaffirm the case we just talked about, Near versus Minnesota. This is a Pentagon Papers case. Um, what happened is Daniel Ellsberg was a defense analyst who leaked uh, these Pentagon Papers to the New York Times that basically said the United States government had been lying about its reasons for Vietnam um, all the way back in to, to the Kennedy and Johnson administration. Well, President Nixon wanted to... Uh, send a message, and President Nixon, um, they tried to censor the New York Times, and when the Supreme Court decided the case, they decided, they said, look, you know, this stuff right here, this happened ten, you know, five or ten years ago. It's not endangering national security. So what it did is it reaffirmed the, the precedent of prior restraint. Now, let's get, you know, for example, if the New York Times here published a front page story that had the longitude and latitude of where Osama bin Laden was hiding in Abbottabad, Pakistan, there's a good chance the government could, could censor that. So in extreme cases of national security, you might see the government uh, censor uh, the, free, the press. But it's extremely, extremely rare. All right. Now, now we are we're still under the First Amendment. We're going to tackle uh, the establishment... And the free exercise clause. All right, so we have freedom of religion in this country, but we need to define it further. All right, the establishment clause. Okay, let me give you an example of of what the um, violating the establishment clause would look like. If I came back on a Monday morning and I said, "Okay, everybody, take out your Bibles. We are going to look at uh, Matthew five, and we are going to discuss it, and then end in prayer." I could not do that as a representative of the state. That would be violating the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which says Congress cannot make a law essentially establishing a state church. Okay, now, the free exercise, which is kind of hidden here behind this, the lemon here, but what free ex the free exercise clause, a violation of that would be, let's say that you and some students are at lunch, and you are doing a, a prayer group, Bible study, and... Somebody from administration sees you at the table with your heads bowed, and they come over to you and they say, you can't do this, it's a public school, you can't be allowed to pray in school. That is a violation of the free exercise clause. So think of free exercise as what you're doing, all right? The establishment clause is what the government is doing. Now, Lemon versus Kurzman, what Lemon versus Kurzman said, and the, the tagline here is aid to parochial schools or private schools. So what happened was that the, the, the case was surrounding an issue of the, the government giving money to private religious schools. And basically what they said was, okay, if the money is going to non-secular things, that's okay. 
But if it's going to like purchase religious materials, that's unconstitutional. So what the court developed was this lemon test, which if, you know, like let's say you have a government policy that might violate the Establishment Clause. Let's say that um, the Denton County Courthouse wants to, you know, um, build a crucifix on the uh, court lawn. Well, you would look at that and go through these tests. So, you know, does the policy have a non-secular religious purpose? And if it does have a non-secular religious purchase, well, then you can stop right there and say, yes, the policy is unconstitutional. So, essentially, if you come up with some government policy that involves the Establishment Clause and it makes it all the way through, then yes, or sorry, no, the policy is, un is constitutional. You don't have to know the ins and outs of this, but it is kind of fun to look at this and say, okay, let's take something, you know, Christmas trees or, you know, the Star of David and a school play or whatever. All right, now this case is the most famous case, and here we go. Here's the, This is a free exercise case. This is no prayer in public schools. This is uh, a very, very controversial case in the Warren Court. So what happened was the New York Board of Regents had, uh, had essentially made a, uh, developed a prayer that was pretty mainstream, um, that pretty much was all-encompassing of Christian faith. And every morning, school students were required to uh, cite this prayer uh, before the day began. And lo and behold, some atheist somewhere gets mad and sued, and the Supreme Court struck this down in Engel versus Vital, 1962. And what that court case said is that teachers may not force students uh, to pray at the beginning of um of school. Now there's all kinds of different Supreme Court cases that have taught, that have expanded on this, you know, can students lead prayer before a football game? Can students lead prayer before graduation? There's so many of these different cases, but it all goes back to Engel versus Vitales, the first time the Supreme Court uh, struck down um, uh, prayer in public schools. So this was a very liberal uh, decision that was highly controversial in the early 1960s. All right, the next Supreme Court case is Miller versus California, 1973. This case is about, this is a free expression case. And basically what Miller versus California said, um, it was about obscenity. So what is obscene? And uh, basically the Supreme Court established this test which said that something was obscene if um, the average person found the work to be lustful or immodest. So the average person, even though this is censored, when they see Michael An Michelangelo's David, they're not going to look at that and say, oh, it's lustful and it's immodest, right? It's a piece, it's art. So this, this is not obscene. Um, if some kind of artwork described in an offensive way, st uh, defined by state law, then that could be considered um, offensive. Or if it has no artistic really value, someone it might be considered obscene. So, for example, if some artist decides to make a statue of the Virgin Mary out of feces, that might be con that might be considering lacking any serious artistic, political, or scientific value. But the most important thing here is community standards, local community standards. Write that down. That is what Miller versus California said. Because what is obscene in Stephenville, Texas, certainly may not be considered obscene in Berkeley, California. So this was the infamous Miller test, 1973. All right, Fourth Amendment cases. These are fun. Now, I want to preface this by saying I am not an attorney. And I am not going to tell you what you can and can't say when it comes to cops. Now, all of you probably have, some, have had some sort of run-in with the law enforcement. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at Fourth Amendment cases. There are so many Fourth Amendment cases um, every year in front of the Supreme Court. It would blow your mind. But the first one we're going to talk about is Matt versus Ohio. Matt versus Ohio, here is the tagline. This is called the exclusionary rule, if I can fit it in here. What the exclusionary rule says is that if law enforcement personnel search you illegally, meaning they don't have your consent or they violate protocol, 
that the evidence that they find after that point is inadmissible in court. It can't be used against you. Let me give you an example of, of the terminology law enforcement uses. They call this the fruit of the poisonous tree. So let's say that you're, you know, you're a police officer, and what every police officer wants to get is a conviction, right? You want to catch the bad guys. Well, the, fruit, the, the exclusionary rule protects us against the behavior of the police. So let's say that this is, this, is, this is getting the bad guy to go to jail. And the police officer, when he commences his search, right, he has to do everything correctly as he's going about the branch to get the fruit. But let's say that he screws up here. Let's imagine that this law enforcement officer screws up. And what happens is he messes up the search, he bungles the evidence, he um, thought he had permission, but he didn't have permission. Well, that means this conviction is invalid. Okay, that means that everything that's found after that point can't be used in court. Now, this is very, very contra controversial. Conservatives will point to this and say this coddles criminal, criminals, but if you think about it, this is, if the police could just search you at will and arrest you and, and say, oh, what's this, a little baggie of white stuff? Well, there's no protection against you. So what it does is protect against the behavior of the police. So law enforcement need probable cause, okay, to search you. That's what, that's what the Fourth Amendment says. Now, like I said, hundreds of cases come before the courts where the question of probable cause is challenged. Probable cause is not defined. Because if you think about it, if you're law enforcement and, and, and you're a police officer and something happens, this is never going to happen. You're never going to know all the facts and all the evidence and be 100% certain that this guy has done something, okay? Also, you're probably not going to be over here. No facts and evidence. But somewhere in between this scale is where police officers um, operate. And most law enforcement officers are um, can be conservative, and they're going to be very, very cautious about what they do. So a hunch, you know, what is a hunch? A hunch, maybe this guy, is, this guy looks shady. He's on the street corner. You know, he's looking around his shoulder. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, but we really can't see, you know, anything going on that might be considered, you know, suspicious. But let's say it moves to reasonable suspicion when we see this guy, you know, looking over his shoulder, and we see another guy approach, and they engage in some sort of transaction that appears to be monetary value, and they switch bags. Well, that might be considered reasonable suspicion. Let's say that what happens next is the person we're observing in the middle of the night, uh, his jacket, uh, he, he moves his arm, and underneath his jacket, we can see that he has a firearm. So then, that, that we could, might be able to consider that probable cause, and then we could be allowed to search him. So this is the spectrum that the uh, law enforcement operates on. Now, there's, out there, there's a certain case that is called Terry versus Ohio. And you don't really need to know this per se, but you need to know that it's a distractor case. Terry versus Ohio is, is a pat down. So for example, like if you're a law enforcement officer, you need to stop someone, you need to talk to them, but they've got a huge jacket on, you can do a brief pat down. Now you can't do a TSA style search, um, you know, but you can look for things like a knife or a gun. So just remember that Terry versus Ohio is not Matt versus Ohio. All right, let's give, let me give you a couple examples of some gray areas. Let's say you're having a party uh, and all your friends are over and you didn't ask them to bring beer. No, they just brought it over anyways. But since you're young and you want to be cool and accepted by your friends, you decide to let the party go. All of a sudden there's a knock at the door. And this idiot over here, if you can see him, he says, hey, come on in. And all of a sudden, the door opens and the cops come in. Is this a legal search? Yes, this is legal. Because if law enforcement don't, if they hear someone say, come in, they don't know if it was the owner, you, or this moron over here. More than likely, this guy's probably not, never getting invited to a party again. All right, so the next scenario, let's say that this is your house here, and you're growing marijuana here. And police, police officers look around, they can't really see what's going on in here, because you cleverly have the temperature so high, and it fogs up the greenhouse windows. But they get in their little police helicopter over here, 
And they fly over and they say, aha, look, we can see cannabis. Can that be used against you? Yes, it can. Because you do not own the air above your house. Alright, so the next one. Let's say you are staying at a hotel and you decide to write on a piece of paper your plans to come and rob me, my house, and steal all my belongings. And you write it down in a detailed note, and then you say, you know what, that's a bad idea. I've got college to think about. And so you crumble it up, and then you throw it in the trash can. Can the cops go and search the trash outside the hotel, or even outside your room, where you deposit it? Yes, right? You do not own the trash. You do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you throw something away. Alright, so briefly what we're going to do is, this is just more, more for fun, we're going to look at some uh, instances where um, the Fourth Amendment search and seizure doesn't really apply. Okay, abandoned property, that's kind of obvious. Um, items exposed to the public, things like payphone, restaurant booths. Um, people don't have a, a, an expectation of privacy there. Um, like if you were in a phone booth, if you could actually ever find one, um, and you were in that phone booth, and the cops wanted to come in there, you can't say, no, 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 it's a Fourth Amendment. You can't come in my phone booth. Uh, school locker? Uh, that is not... You do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Nobody at Hebron even uses a locker, but if they did, they would be under reasonable suspicion. And if you remember from that last slide, that's one step before probable cause. Um, optical aids, things like binoculars, mirrors, cameras are okay, right? If law enforcement can see across a clear line of sight into your property that you're doing something illegal, you can't say, well, it's not fair because you had binoculars. You know, you're just an idiot. All right, now we'll look at some other ones. Now, let's look at some instances where there are exceptions for the police needing a warrant to search, right? We call these exigent circumstances. Okay, this one is called a search incident to lawful arrest, or the lunge rule. What that means is, like, if you're being arrested or detained by the police, they do not need a warrant to search the backseat of your car, because you could possibly lunge back there for a weapon. Uh, basically, if you are being arrested for a DWI or something else in your car, the officers are going to make you sit outside the car, and basically they have uh, free range to search your vehicle because you've been arrested. All right, example number two, where law enforcement does not need a warrant. This is called the plain view rule. Uh, do, I don't even, do I really need to explain this? Basically, if you are stupid enough to have evidence or something illegal in plain view, officers do not need a warrant to search. You're just an idiot. Okay, this one kind of falls under the plain view doctrine. Um, you know, if, if a motor vehicle search doesn't necessarily need a warrant, uh, here we go, this is probable cause, right? If, if you're dumb enough to have, you know, a bag of weed or something in the back of your car here, and the officer sees it, then they do not need a warrant to uh, search the rest of the vehicle. The next one, uh, consent searches. If you give your consent uh, to a search, uh, then obviously officers don't need a warrant. Now, can you revoke your consent? Yes and no. Um, I'm not entirely clear. I know that you can revert, revoke your consent, and you can tell officers where you are, uh, where they can and can't search. But I don't want to go into that. I don't want to give you any bad advice, and then the next thing you know, you're arrested, and you're blaming your government teacher on going to jail. Maybe it's just me, but I think this guy should be searched. The next one: border and airport security zones, including even football stadiums and other public events, public arenas are not subject to uh, a search warrant. These are what we're going to call high risk or high uh, security areas, and so officers do not need a warrant to search you. Immigration has conveniently placed this sign here in case you do realize that you have something illegal on you. Hot pursuit is an interesting one. Uh, law enforcement officers, if they are pursuing this guy, they do not need a warrant uh, to search your home if he comes running through your house. They can just continue to pursue him. Now the question is what happens if they see something in your house that's, Ill that's illegal? They could probably go back and use that as, as evidence. Uh, now I want to, there's something I forgot to mention about the exclusionary rule. It doesn't mean that if, let's say you committed a crime and you're pulled over and the cops 
they search the back of your, your trunk and they don't have your permission, but they find a body, uh, that doesn't mean that you're off the hook. That just means that a jury would never know that there was a body in the back of your trunk. The DA, the prosecution, pr could probably connect you to that body a different way, but it's not like you get off scot-free. Emergencies, this is kind of obvious, moving right along. We already kind of talked about this one, the, t the stop and frisk rule, that officers can search you uh, if they believe it's beneficial to their own safety, right? If they find a weapon on you, that is not illegal. They can't, like, do a full, full cavity search on you. But they can, if they're questioning you and you keep act acting erratic and non-responsive, they can search you to make sure you don't have a weapon. All right, now we're going to switch gears and talk about the Fifth and Sixth Amendment cases. Now, we're going to go... Normally, we've been going in the correct order of the amendments, but first we're going to talk about the Sixth Amendment and then the Fifth in this one because chronologically it makes more sense. Before the Warren Court, states had a great deal of latitude in terms of how they would conduct their criminal justice system. So, unless there was some gross abuse of police authority, states could largely do what they wanted to do. Since the 1940s, Hugo Black had been arguing that the Civil War had changed all that. That if the 14th Amendment meant anything, it was that the Bill of Rights must protect people not only against the federal government, but against the actions of any government in every state. He says, quote, its provisions may be thought outdated abstractions by some. And it is true that they were designed to meet ancient evils, but they are the same kind of human evils that have emerged from century to century whenever excessive power is sought by the few at the expense of the many. In my judgment, Hugo Black goes on, the people of no nation can lose their liberty so long as a Bill of Rights like ours survives. I would follow what I believe was the original purpose of the 14th Amendment to extend to all the people of the nation the complete protection of the Bill of Rights. Clarence Earl Gideon had broken into a pool hall in Florida and had been convicted of breaking and entering, but he didn't have a lawyer. He was too poor to afford one. And when the case got to the Supreme Court, the argument on behalf of Gideon was it's simply a violation of due process of law for a person to be tried and convicted in a criminal court without a lawyer. People that can afford one have those protections, but poor people don't. It was something that every American could understand was wrong. If the prosecutor's a lawyer and you are an indigent defendant, which probably means you're really down on your luck, how are you gonna win? Gideon was the one that somehow went to the heart of the whole criminal trial process. Gideon was the embodiment of Hugo Black's argument that Bill of Rights guarantees ought to apply to the states. I knew as we worked on that opinion, here was one that was gonna be in the case books as long as people study American constitutional law. This would be one of the big ones. For Black, the restrictions on state power were in the words of the Constitution. There it was, in black and white. Now, you may not have caught that, but I hope you noticed where they were talking about the incorporation doctrine. They talked about it without actually saying it, but Justice Black using the 14th Amendment to say, hey, look, no state shall deprive its citizens due process. And Clarence Earl Gideon uh, did not get a trial, uh, did not get a fair trial his first time. And so he actually wrote to the Supreme Court and just said he deserved one, and he got the court to grant a writ of certiorari, and he was retried, and he was found innocent. So if you're ever in a courtroom someday and you can't afford an attorney, you need to thank Clarence Earl Gideon. So whether it's from a uh, traffic violation all the way up to espionage, no matter who you are in this country, you cannot be deprived of legal counsel. Now notice that it doesn't say, the Sixth Amendment doesn't say that you cannot be deprived of good legal counsel, but you get some sort of attorney because there is no way that, that any of us 
that are the, most of us, I would argue, um, who are charged with a crime could stand up a, alone against the wheels and the machinery of the state. And so you need someone to step in and, and, and pr act as uh, kind of like an offensive line uh, to protect you. All right, now we will jump to the next case. This is a Fifth Amendment case, very, very famous, Miranda versus Arizona. More and more through the 1960s, Black's liberal colleagues pushed into territory where he wouldn't follow. The leadership of the liberal wing was passing to younger colleagues, like William Brennan from New Jersey. Nevertheless, where Black saw his way clear, say, on issues of a fair trial, he was still in the vanguard. In 1966, the court put an end to a practice that Hugo Black had seen and decried as a young prosecutor back in Birmingham in the 1920s. In Miranda against Arizona, the court finally came to the last stage of its concern with police brutality and interrogation techniques, which they thought were unfair. And they did it in a fairly dramatic fashion. If you're going to admit a confession against the defendant at trial, you've got to show that he was warned that he had a right to remain silent. And more importantly, that he had a right to a lawyer if he wished one. And finally, that if he couldn't afford a lawyer, the state would pay for one. After the war in court, you cannot introduce illegally seized evidence into a trial. States can't do that. Previously, they could. After Gideon v. Wainwright, you have to have an attorney represent you in a trial. After Miranda, you cannot use a coerced confession in a trial to demonstrate guilt. That has to be excluded from a trial. So what you do is you move from a, a state-based criminal justice system to a criminal justice system that has to conform with nationally imposed rules. 30 years had passed since Black joined the court. He had little left to prove now. When LBJ appointed Thurgood Marshall, the man who'd led the legal assault on segregation, Marshall asked that old Klansman, Hugo Black, to give him the oath of office. But just as Black's great arch of rights was receiving its capstone, people started saying it should be torn down. As Marshall took his seat, cities were going up in flames. There was a crime wave in the country. Public attitudes about the court were changing, and not for the better. Was the court protecting liberties or criminals? Mr. Justice, do you think that those decisions have made it more difficult for the police to combat crime? Certainly. Why shouldn't they? What were they written for? Why did they write the Bill of Rights? They practically all relate to the way cases shall be tried. And practically all of them make it more difficult to convict people of crime. What about guaranteeing a man a right to a lawyer? Of course that makes it more difficult to convict him. What about saying he shall not be compelled to be a witness against himself? That makes it more difficult to convict him. What about the no such unreasonable search or seizure shall be made? That makes it more difficult. They were written to make it more difficult. And what Black could protest in his time-honored way. There are the words in black and white. But the country around him was changing. No one saw the change more clearly than the GOP nominee for president in 1968. Some of our courts in their decisions have gone too far in weakening the peace forces as against the criminal forces in this country. Crimes of violence in the United States have almost doubled in recent years. Today, a violent crime is committed every 60 seconds. Richard Nixon has a heyday with these rulings, particularly Miranda. He says that the Warren Court has been coddling criminals. And he sets out to win the White House, in part based on the idea that he will appoint new justices to the Supreme Court. And it will get worse unless we take the offensive. Freedom from fear is a basic right of every American. We... 
Now what I love about that clip is not only does it talk about Miranda, but it also talks about the changing nature of public opinion towards the courts. And you start to see the waning era, the sun kind of setting on the liberal Warren court and this uh, move to a more ju uh, cry for judicial restraint. So what Miranda said, Miranda versus Arizona, contrary to hundreds of uh, episodes of Law and Order, was that your Miranda rights had to be read to you before you were arrested and charged with a crime. Not when you're being questioned on the street or being detained. They're not going to slam you onto the hood of the car and read the Miranda rights like they do in the, in the movies. Miranda said was that if you got this Venn diagram here, and whenever it overlaps, right, when you're handcuffed, okay, if you're handcuffed and you are being charged with, or charged with a crime. So, for example, when it overlaps, then you must be read your Miranda. So, for example, you could be detained by the side of the road and handcuffed and not had your Miranda rights read to you. You could also be taken in for questioning uh, and also not have your Miranda rights read to you. So, if, so if you confess to something and then claim that you didn't have your Miranda rights, they'll say, well, did we charge you with a crime? You'll say, no, then your Miranda rights didn't need to be read to you. Uh, and so when this overlaps, that's when your Miranda rights must be read to you, when you are handcuffed and being charged with a crime. And the Supreme Court, since 1966, has been eroding away Miranda rights, uh, and, and, and especially with and Matt versus Ohio and the exclusionary rule. So you've seen the court take a, a gradual shift to the right. All right, Eighth Amendment cases. There's really only one that you need to know, about, and that is Gregg versus Georgia in 1976. Uh, what that one said was that the death penalty was not necessarily constitutional or unconstitutional. Uh, and there, there was a time in our history whenever uh, the death penalty was off the books. Uh, Gregg versus Georgia put it back on the books in 1976 by saying, look, it's not constitutional or unconstitutional. The Constitution is silent on it. All right, now we are to our last two. These are Ninth Amendment cases. Now, if you remember from Fat Sit Jets, the P stands for rights to the people, unenumerated rights. And this is where we get the unenumerated right of privacy. The first case we are going to talk about is Griswold versus Connecticut, 1965. The case was about an old state law that made it a crime to give contraceptives, even advice about preventing pregnancies, even to married couples. For Douglas, this looked like his last best chance to enshrine a right to privacy into constitutional case law. To Douglas, there was nothing more sacred than the right to be left alone. And the way he went out asserting that right was also characteristic Douglas. He simply declared it. Anyone who didn't like it could go to hell. Just as Douglas's opinion was quite radical, in that it didn't ground this right of privacy in a single place in the Constitution. He didn't find explicitly a right to privacy, but he says if you look to the First Amendment, the right to association and the right to believe what you will, and you look to the Fourth Amendment, the right to be free of unreasonable searches and seizures, and you look at the Fifth Amendment, the right to be protected against self-incrimination, that if you put all these various, uh, the emanations and penumbras from those explicit rights together, uh, you surely have a constitutional right to privacy. Uh, and that was his opinion. Douglas's assertion wasn't good enough for Hugo Black. It was as if he'd pulled his rumpled old copy of the Constitution out of his pocket, just to check, and he couldn't find the word privacy in there anywhere. I like my privacy as well as the next one, he wrote in his dissent, but I am nevertheless compelled to admit that the government has a right to invade it unless prohibited by some specific constitutional provision. Okay, so the tagline with Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965 is zones of privacy or penumbras of privacy. And what this Supreme Court case is, is a precursor to one of the most famous controversial Supreme Court cases in the last half century, and that is Roe v. Wade. You have a case coming from Texas, begun by a woman who on paper, at least, is named Jane Roe. 
She was 21 years old. She was pregnant, and she didn't want to have this baby. The Texas law was one of the strictest in the nation. It allowed abortion only in cases to save the life of the mother. So even if you had a situation where a young woman had been raped or the victim of incest, she still could not get an abortion in Texas. Equal pay for equal work. Join our town. Equal pay for equal work. Women were, by definition, uh, by nature, intended, many people believed, to take care of homes and children. And to say that's not true, but that women have a right to be lawyers and doctors and police officers, that was radical. You have the Equal Rights Amendment moving through the Senate and the House. You have Ms. Magazine being started by Gloria Steinem. You have the American Civil Liberties Union starting a women's rights project. There's a lot of agitation in America over women's rights. Abortion is our right. Women unite. Abortion is our right. In those days, there was an assumption that if you had a baby, if you were a mother, you were no longer entitled to pursue a career. Abortion rights meant symbolically that women did have choices. Women could say, not now, later, or not at all. I think the justices believed that the women's rights movement was so clearly the wave of the future that was just about to happen that everybody's for abortion because everybody's for women's rights. In fact, in conference, there was an easy majority for striking down the Texas law. Warren Berger gives the opinion to his friend, Harry Blackman. Harry Blackman and Warren Berger had been childhood chums in Minnesota. Warren Berger, I think, believes that he could have more control over the opinion. Blackman didn't know why Berger assigned the opinion to him. Maybe because he'd been counseled to the Mayo Clinic back in Minnesota. But what would his doctor friends think about this case? Blackman was in turmoil. At home, his three grown daughters happened to be visiting. So at supper, Blackman put the question, what are your views on abortion? By the time his wife and three daughters sounded off on him, Blackman announced, I think I'll go lie down. I'm getting a headache. Justice Blackman was a very green justice at this point in his career. The workload is very tough for him. This is a very hard case. It's very much of a burden within the marble walls. From CBS News headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The majority in cases from Texas and Georgia said that the decision to end a pregnancy during the first three months belongs to the woman and her doctor, not the government. Thus, the anti-abortion laws of 46 states were rendered unconstitutional. How in the world did such a conservative justice write this incredibly activist, liberal opinion in Roe? Well, if you go back and read the opinion, it doesn't read as some sort of charter of feminist rights. It reads as a charter of doctor's rights. He actually researched the history of abortion, and his visceral response was, the state ought not to be telling doctors how to regulate pregnancy. Whether you like abortion or dislike abortion, you can't like Justice Blackmun's majority opinion. It tells you a lot about the history of abortion. But what the history of abortion has to do with the United States Constitution is a tie that Justice Blackmun was not able to make. This is an opinion that has a result, but without reason. He's looking at it in terms of a decision that should be left between a physician and a woman. But of course, this is a test of what the Constitution holds. And what he ends up doing in his opinion is grounding it in a right of privacy. William Rehnquist was in the Justice Department and helped screen black men. And here he sees this man writing this very expansive opinion in Roe versus Wade. Lewis Powell is joining it. Warren Berger is joining it. Rehnquist is by himself among the Nixon appointees at that time. Bill Rehnquist saw the Constitution very narrowly protecting individual rights. So he never could have envisioned a right of privacy to be found in the Constitution. Rehnquist is arguing that the court has no business deciding it. There's no constitutional hook. 
because you can't pretend that the text of the Constitution says anything about abortion. You can't pretend that the legislative history of the 14th Amendment says anything about abortion. You can't find a precedent in the Supreme Court that says anything about abortion. This one's out of the blue.